Hey everyone. Let's get started here. First off, a big thank you to all of the speakers and attendees for joining this year's Polkadot at Decoded. Whether it is here in Copenhagen, or online, behind the live stream, or at one of the 39 live viewing parties that happen right now all across the globe, I'm very, very grateful and excited to be joining you here today. This event for me is a celebration of the Polkadot ecosystem. How far we've come, right? Where we are going. And what we may have to do to get there is all that's being discussed here. But more than anything, I still believe that um, these are the kind of opportunities and places um, that allow us as a community to connect, share, learn, and welcome all of the new joiners. Now, I'd like to start off by spending a couple of moments revisiting the driving force behind Polkadot. Polkadot inception was really rooted in the idea of a new decentralized internet called Web3, which Ethereum and Polkadot founder Gavin Wood first termed in, back in 2014 when he started writing his blog post about it and starting speaking about it. Now, this idea really tries to address the flaws of today's monopolized internet, right? That is based on centralized, broken by design technologies that I believe really have shown over time um, their negative impact on us as individuals, but even more so at our societies at large. And these negative impacts have become over time more prevalent. Now, behind this idea is an underlying ethos, an ethos that champions decentralization as a means to breaking us free from those monopolistic structures that today control our digital destiny. And instead, this idea tries to move us to greater empowerment of the edges, of the individual, of the prosumers. And I think it is crucially important for all of us to remember that this is not a one-year mission, it's a decades-long mission that requires all of us to build for permanence rather than following the temptation of chasing the latest short-term hype. So, if I think about this mission, right, and I try to express it in the most concise way possible, what I end up is written right here, on the top. Creating a world based on truthful rather than trustful interaction. So, over the years, right, like, I've heard a multitude of different um, personalities, individuals, communities speaking about Polkadot. And I've often seen Polkadot being misunderstood, in my mind, as being just the Polkadot relay chain or a layer zero or interoperability protocol. Instead, what I would say is that Polkadot is based upon three main pillars. The first pillar is the large and thriving community of brilliant actors that are rallied around the collective purpose about, of creating a new decentralized internet. Community, super important. The second pillar is the set of technologies that together form a block space ecosystem. This block space ecosystem today comprises Again, three things. All the parachains being built on Polkadot, all the smart contracts and decentralized applications 
built on top of those parachains. And as well, all the users and assets that engage with these decentralized applications. Now, the third main pillar is the DOT token, which is a utility token that serves three main purposes. Purchasing block space, the first one. Securing the network we are staking, second one. And the third one is really granting its holders rights to participate in the determination of the future of Polkadot. The, so it's like participatory rights in Polkadot's governance. And now, on the DOT token, if you think about it, right, particularly in light of it being the means to allow you to purchase block space, further than that, in my view, the way I look at the DOT token, right, is that it is the most accessible means to participate in the Web3 feature being built. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the last six years, right, since we started as a community building Polkadot, setting out and building this crazy thing. Over these six years, we have intentionally focused our energy and resourcing on building the best technical foundation. Whereas most others out there, many of the other ecosystems, have made irrevocable sacrifices on their technical foundation because they prioritized short-term adoption over long-term viability, either via premature developer experience or user experience optimizations, or via aggressive marketing and business development spending. Now, I think most of Polkadot's perceived competitors today have taken directions that I believe will lead to their irrelevance in the long run. I'm thinking here specifically of networks that hold every other month, right? or those that you can only interact with via a centralized RPC provider, because the need for truly trustless ways to interact with weren't considered or discarded as being too difficult during the development of those systems. There, I would ask, what is the point of building these systems that are designed in such a way that they can be shut down or censored? Send off or censored by a small handful of actors, regardless whether they, these actors act from a point of malice or incompetence. In contrast to that, many of the original ideas behind Polkadot have become canon now. Ethereum, Polygon, Cosmos, and others are increasingly following Polkadot's technical direction. For example, our, early, our community's very early bet on heterogeneous sharding, shared security, and cross-chain composability is nothing crazy anymore. In fact, I would go as far to say that it has progressed from being, rather than being theory, it's practice now. We see that on Polkadot today. It's, you know, transitioned from speculation to fact. And I think it is super safe to say now that a multi-chain future is table stakes. So, looking at all that has been built, right, and the properties that Polkadot, the fundamental technology behind Polkadot proposes, right, gets me to the point where I'm more confident than ever that Polkadot's technical foundation is providing the most viable path to deliver on Web3's promises. Polkadot is now a securely scalable, composable, flexible, governable and censorship-resistant platform. 
And as such, it brings to life a truly unstoppable block space ecosystem. Moreover, then, moreover, beyond that, right, Polkadot is now considered the most energy efficient public blockchain network out there, or as, other, as some people call it, greenest. And from my read, there appears to be recognition by one particularly active regulator in the US that Polkadot is sufficiently decentralized for its native utility token to be considered software rather than a security. Now, building this sophisticated, extremely robust and future-proof technology, te technical foundation, didn't come easy. It took, in fact, dozens, if not hundreds, of extraordinary skilled and dedicated contributors almost six years to deliver it. But taking that time was necessary to do things right in order to ensure that Polkadot will remain relevant in the long run. And I think it is important for us to recognize that one could not have gotten where we are today in a short matter of time. All that said, right, while it's really exciting to acknowledge the extensive ground we have covered by now, it is also very important to reflect on the fact that this has made the past few years quite difficult for many. For many of us builders, especially. On one hand, there are the core developers behind Polkadot that sacrificed countless nerves, sleepless nights, and thousands of leaders of Club Mate. Then there are all the pioneer projects that committed to using Polkadot early, and as such had to endure quite a bit of pain. What am I thinking of here, right? I'm thinking here, for example, of the not quite great developer experience and user experience, and the many, many breaking changes we all had to deal with over the years. Last but not least, when Polkadot was finally ready for projects to deploy their creations in the form of parrot chains roughly one and a half years ago, they unfortunately had to launch into the depth of a bear market. And in fact, all of us are still trying to scale in the depth of a bear market. And if you really think about what that means for those individual and teams, right, it's quite drastic. It means that on top of the normal stresses that come with creating in a nascent space such as ours, you also have to deal with additional pressures of more severe capital constraints, a shifting regulatory landscape, and what sometimes feels like an uphill battle to win the hearts and minds of those, of those people, particularly against the dominant monopolistic Web2 philosophy. On the bright side, I would say now the technical foundation that has been built here can hardly be matched or leapfrogged. And slowly but surely, we are starting to see the fruits of our labor. But do not mistake me. This is not a call. This is not a time to rest or pause. Instead, I see us being at an inflection point here, where now the time has come to capitalize upon these foundational capabilities that have been built by making it dramatically easier to use Polkadot for developers, and application, uh, and application users alike. To that end, Parity has already started to take some steps towards improving the developer experience. And I would like to talk about a couple of them. 
there's an imminent Polkadot 1.00 release upcoming. And this release marks our first long-term support release. Long-term support releases will be maintained for six months past. And the purpose of these long-term support release track is really to provide battle-tested and stable releases to parachain developers and ensure that there's a reduced need for parachain teams to deal with frequent um, breaking changes. The long-term support release track will cover three technologies slash products crucially. Cumulus, Substrate, and Polkadot. We also have started publishing in-depth release analysis reports on the Polkadot forum. These are meant to really make it significantly easier for anyone that is building a parachain on Polkadot to quickly figure out if any of the changes in the release are very relevant for, to them and or determine action that needs to be taken. Then there's, of course, a frame team, right? The framework for developing runtime, parachain runtimes, in essence, right? Super crucial tool for parachain developers. And the frame team has been starting to putting a lot more effort into towards improving developer experience. Besides others, they are trying to address the most pressing friction points of today, which are weight setting, and migrations. Further, there's a major effort going into an entire revamp of our documentation, spanning, again, the most crucial areas to parachain developers, such as Frame and XCM. Beyond that, we are now maintaining two parachain templates that are ready to use out of the box and which come pre-packaged with the most widely used palettes. And that will lead us to a point in our community and new joiners that essentially all they have to do, right, to get a parachain, uh, get started with a parachain, pick up that template, build your custom business logic into your palette, integrate it, and get going. Adjustments to the economic model of allocating Polkadot block space will be proposed very shortly. And up in acceptance of those changes, right, they would lead to the reduction of the upfront capital commitments currently associated with parachain slot leases. In a similar direction and very related to that aspect, long-awaited on-demand parachains that were previously termed para-threats, are closer than ever. They, and I think they are such a crucial element for us to deliver as a community because they will drastically reduce the economic entry hurdles, and an early version has been recently successfully been tested on a testnet. Now, There's a lot more that can be done around developer experience. And what I would like to do here is like set out a rally and cry for all of you to join us in trying to improve the developer experience on Polkadot. Make it great. And to name a few of the, of, of the other community members that come to my mind that have already stepped into that, Brian Chen, for example, with uh, his testing framework, Chopsticks, right? We have seen the XCM emulator that was equally built by community members. But I believe particularly around the, uh, the area of XCM, there is so much more we can do. Tooling, tooling, tooling on one hand, and on the other hand, examples, usage patterns. Overall, I really believe that with a focused effort of all of us, we can make it dramatically easier, faster, and more affordable to build up on Polkadot. Yeah, that's another area. We're all pretty keen on seeing progress. User experience, right? User experience has 
historically been a much decrying challenge for our ecosystem. And while there's still a lot that can be improved, I think our community has made quite a lot of progress over the past 12 months up on this front. You know, for example, right, in the past, a lack of robust user-friendly wallets used to be a major pain point. For a long time, the only available option for our users for interacting with Polkadot was the Polkadot JS UI, which you see here on the left side. Now, I think we probably can all agree that having to refer your users to this blockchain equivalent of a nuclear power plant command center isn't quite the best idea. But, in my opinion, that's a thing of the past. Instead, there are now excellent alternatives readily available in the marketplace with absolutely fantastic UX. To name a few of them, right? What comes to my mind, Nova, Talisman, Subwallet, they have all done a tremendous job on improving Polkadot's UX. But I think, you know, we shouldn't stop there, even with regard to wallets. I think there's a next step that might be really worth evaluating. I believe, for example, we should simplify the end-user onboarding experience by ensuring that such products are easily discoverable, that they are being championed and promoted adequately. And to that end, I see an opportunity for us here to come together to transform the Polkadot Network website, which sees over a million visitors each month, into a seamless entry point into the world of Polkadot. By, for example, prominently, prominently surfacing or even integrating applicable Polkadot-based apps into the website. And here, we could utilize some of Polkadot's strengths again. Let's use on-chain governance to come to consensus on which one, for example, if a choice has to be made. If we wanted, we could even go a step further than that. We could consider using on-chain governance to lend the Polkadot name and the brand, the design language, to one wallet of each of these categories, right? Be it a mobile wallet, a desktop wallet, and thereby elevate its profile. Likewise, we could explore integrating one of the governance UIs, such as Polka Assembly or Subscreer, into, the, into governance.polkadot.network. Once again, using Polkadot's on-chain governance to grant the team behind the chosen product funding and the mandate to do so. Now, hardware wallets have been another important piece, right? for the experience of a user, for them being able to engage, be it institutional or retail user. And with Polkadot War Vault, which was previously um, named Parity Sina, we've had a more than decent product available to us for quite some time. But it's not enough. And that's primarily because the most widely adopted hardware wallet out there has been and will remain for some time to be Ledger which unfortunately hasn't thus far worked great for engaging with parachains. And based upon that, and knowing how much of a significant pain point that has been, and how much it has been holding us back to gain further traction, I'm particularly happy to say that after some intense discussions and brainstorming sessions that we had this, this past week, I'm now more optimistic than ever that in a relatively short matter of time, we will see a brand new Polkadot Ledger app that will emerge soon and that will once and hopefully for all um, ensure that all parachains are supported by Ledger out of the box. The technical path that we discussed seems very viable. Another area. I think of improvement that will propel us forward is improving the experience of how users 
bring their assets that they acquired on a centralized exchange onto their target destination in Polkadot. You may remember that, you know, until very recently, the only possible way to do so was for your users to follow a page-long instruction on how to get their recently acquired tokens from the exchange onto the parachain. That's not a great experience, of course not. But instead, we have recently figured out improvements to Polkadot system and the tooling around it that will make it able, that will allow users in the future going forward to withdraw tokens or NFTs or whatever it is from the exchange account straight into the designer final target account wherever on Polkadot with just one click. Likewise, it is about to get a whole lot easier for institutional custodians, custodians exchanges, and other market intermediaries to integrate with Polkadot-based parachains. All these improvements are mainly brought forward by recent developments to the system parachain called Asset Hub, our cross-consensus messaging capabilities, XCM, and last but not least, an integration tool called Asset Transfer API. Now, I want to wrap up that section by you know, pointing to one more improvement that I think will be quite instrumental to improving the UX of Polkadot. And that is async backing. Many of you may be familiar with that, right? But for those of you that are not, I want to explain briefly what the impact of it is. So async backing is on the horizon, and it will allow blockchains, parachains, to speed up their block rate by roughly 2x, effectively reducing parachains transaction confirmation time from a maximum of 12 seconds to 6 seconds. But we do not actually have to stop there because it was designed in such a way that you decouple the relay chains, the overarching chain's tick rate from the parachain's block tick rate. And that means with certain improvements to the Collida node, to Cumulus, we may, in a reasonable amount of time, even get to reducing the block candidate, the parachain candidate production time to much less than that. If a parachain choose to want that from a UX perspective. Now, on the governance from the governance and treasury front, there have been also major developments recently, right? Most of you will have seen the news about the launch of OpenGov on Polkadot, which really put the power of like determining the future of Polkadot entirely in the hand of the dot holder community. Further, I don't quite remember if it was last year or earlier this year, the core fellowship, the core technical fellowship was um, established. It is essentially an on-chain governance body comprised of the most talented and knowledgeable individuals, technical individuals, knowing and having built the Polkadot protocol that can convene there and exert some decision-making and support the decision-making process around Polkadot. And I think the primitive that, that powers this fellowship, which is called collectives, is a primitive we should make use of much more extensively. As an example here, we could use it to create another fellowship, an ecosystem, a parachain technical fellowship, right? With, you know, knowledgeable, capable technologists that have, over the last couple of years, built parachains and gained an incredible amount of knowledge and insight. And we could grant this fellowship as a community certain hard powers, for example, around um, unbreaking a chain, if that should ever be needed. Or they could be granted uh, funding, right? 
They could be granted, you know, a sub-treasury that they can, you know, assign and use to fund uh, the tools and things that they need for them. Another new development on the, um, on the governance side and the Polkadot DAO side is the, the developments around multi-asset treasuries. What does that mean? Well, today the Polkadot treasury can only hold DOT and control DOT, right? Now, in the near future, the Polkadot treasury will also be able to hold other assets, many other assets, including stablecoins. And more than that, as already pointed towards to, it will have the ability to form sub-treasuries, maybe purpose-bound sub-treasuries, right? Um, around which we design governance models that are much more purpose-built for the spending that they should um, enact, leading, hopefully, to more accountability around that spending. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the momentum and activity that we've seen and how it has changed over the last year. I think it's fair to say that despite the headwinds of the past year on both the market and the regulatory front that we have all been exposed to, Polkadot shows incredible momentum in terms of community growth, steaming ahead, full throttle. And let me tell you why I say that, right? If I look at, for example, what's happened on the developer traction end, right? I think it is really, again, a testament to Polkadot's strong open source ethos and technology that, irregardless of its early shortcomings around developer experience and user experience, Polkadot has consistently shown the strongest adoption among developers by a wide margin, only second to the much, much older Ethereum. Over the past 12 months, once again, the monthly active deaths on Polkadot have grown. This time by 43% from 1,400 to 2,000 monthly active developers. Furthermore, in this year alone, so since January 1st, 2023, we have seen 100,000 code contributions to the Polkadot repositories. Last but not least, we have now, now you will find online 556 unique frame palettes published, which is an increase of 71% compared to last year at the same time. And particularly the frame palettes and the monthly active deaths are, I think, a very, very good reflection of the health of Polkadot's developer ecosystem. Frame, here again, is that library of powerful open source modules. And I believe, to my best knowledge, this number of 556 modules is absolutely unmatched by any other modular blockchain te technology stack. But it's not all about developers, of course, right? They are also the creations that those developers create. They are the parachains, or those contracts being deployed on parachains. And as mentioned earlier in my talk, right, remember that the ability to launch, to deploy a parachain on Polkadot was really only, came only really came to light one and a half years ago. And despite that, today we have 82 parachains that are secured and made interoperable by Polkadot and its wild cousin, Kusama. This is up from 42 parachains last year at the same time. So, almost double. And some of these parachains, as I mentioned, are smart contract platforms in themselves, hosting today hundreds of decentralized applications, growing by much every day. Now, one stat I don't have here, but one that makes me particularly bullish on Polkadot, is the fact that since XCM launched, you know, 
um, and particularly within the last 12 months, the number of open XCM um, channels, so these are these channels that allow different parachains to talk to each other, right? have increased from 66 to 300 over the last 12 months. And up until today, 600,000 messages have been sent across these channels on Polkadot and Kusama. Now, all of this has not gone unnoticed to the world, right? While it may sometimes seem like that in a bear market, it hasn't gone unnoticed, no, by no means. And, you know, why I think parachain teams are so crucially important as the pioneers in our space, these Web3 native teams that really set the path for others to follow. There are Web2 companies that have large captive user bases, large captive amounts of assets, right, that can help Polkadot propel it forward 10 steps. And those are the ones. To those, it hasn't gone unnoticed what, what has been built in this community. And over the past couple of months, particularly, we have seen a number of announcements by, by those large corporations that they have chosen Polkadot and they want to make a bet on it and deploy on it. So, let's speak about users a little bit. Over the past 12 months, we've seen an 80% year-on-year increase in Unix accounts. We've seen a 188% increase year-on-year -year in monthly fee-paying transactions across Polkadot. Staking is becoming increasingly popular. The number of nominators is up to up 29,000, right? Um, from or has grown by 52% from 29,000 to 44, 2 point, 2,000. And today, we have 4 million DOT added to pools. Almost 12,000 people are actively bonding. And if my last stats are correct, that is growing by roughly 1,500 new users joining nomination pools every day, uh, every month. So, all together, how do you look at that, right? I think the foundation is super strong. We as a community and, you know, technology platform, which Polkadot is, has something very unique to offer. I would call it the most connected, composable block space ecosystem. The only one with real shared security. But it is still the early days. And end user adoption is certainly still in its very early stages across the entire industry. Five billion people use the internet, and it is super safe to assume that only a tiny, tiny fraction use Web3 applications today. So the opportunity is huge, the mission is critical, and the target on our back is real. So what do we do? Well, we do what we do best. We keep building. I think this is a time to together show the world what we as a community have to offer, both philosophically and functionally being committed to the Web3 vision. On that end, I want to extend a big thank you for your partnership, vision, support, feedback, criticism, tenacity, and commitment. Let's make a difference here, all together as we are Polkadot. Thank you.